Good morning. It's a privilege to worship with you. Real blessing. Last night, the program, the Christmas program, uh, everyone did such a good job um, in the work, the preparation that went behind it. And now we get to study God's Word together. Uh, I came in late. I got carried away with the fellowship of the saints. It's just such a sweet thing to, to be uh, with God's people and to be with you. Um, and uh, this morning, uh, we, I'd like to look at Hebrews chapter 1. Um, as Warren prayed, it points to the superiority of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is and what He has accomplished. And in this Christmas season, um, that's what we've been reflecting on. And with, with last night, that's where my mind has been. And... Um, the events surrounding the first advent, uh, the first arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ who came into this world, born of a virgin. We consider in this season Mary and Joseph who um, made that journey into Bethlehem uh, at the census. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ born in a stable, laid in a manger, uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes. We ponder and consider these things. No room for him in the inn. Um, and like any parent holds a baby, you can, you can see Mary and Joseph caring for this little one, um, looking intently into his face, you know, as, as we do with our children, wondering, you know, what are, what are they going to be when they grow up? Uh, what's in store for their lives? Uh, pondering what has already been revealed to them um, by the Holy Spirit. And then the shepherds show up um, and they come and see the infant, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, just as the angel had told him, uh, told them, uh, Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world, uh, laid in a manger and astonished and in wonderment of what has been revealed to them. Uh, and then we consider Simeon and Anna um, uh, in the temple where Jesus is then presented about 40 days after his birth, the infant. And Simeon takes the baby in his arms. He blesses the Lord. And his words, I think, are relevant to what we are looking at this morning. He says, now, Lord, you're, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have presented in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I know that's a lengthy introduction to our text, but that's what we reflect on in this season. That's what we're really teaching our, our children uh, in this season, pointing them to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his magnificence in awe and wonder. So turn with me, if you will. That's where the, the writer of Hebrews points us, the very start. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed, appointed heir of all things, through whom... Also, he made the world, and he is the radiance of the glory of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he, has made, when he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Uh, that's our focus this morning. Lord Jesus Christ and his work and who he is in his person. I think uh, before diving into the text, it's valuable to consider. We're not going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so uh, through the whole book. So I won't spend much time here. But regarding the authorship of Hebrew, of Hebrews, um, <clears throat> Uh, Warren prayed uh, in, in his prayer. He mentioned the writer. It's a deeply theological book. The world loves its superstars and loves 
uh, the, the dynamic quarterbacks or the, the playmakers, the dynamic speaker, charismatic personalities. They love to put the name um, there on the, the jersey, uh, but not so with the Lord. Um, rather, than just the opposite. We see the Lord God consistently choosing and using the obscure um, and often the nameless, uh, using them in mighty ways. Um, for his redemptive purposes. There are many that we would consider heroes of the faith. I use the word heroes loosely here, but I think you understand like the Spurgeons, the Calvins, the, the Luthers, uh, the Pauls, uh, um, uh, uh, not, not in that ranking order by any means, but I, I think some of the greatest heroes of the faith will never hear their names, will never know uh, who they are um, uh, on this side of, the, of eternity. And this is the case for the writer of the book of Hebrews. There's been much speculation over the course of church history on who, who wrote this, this magnificent letter, this book. But what we do know is the, the, the authorship is of divine nature. It's the Holy Spirit, the Lord God, inspired a man, someone, but he's nameless, um, to, uh, to write this. Um, and this is the living word of God. But the human hand that penned this magnificent theological work remains nameless. And I think that's something that is worth considering and, and reflecting upon. Uh, the world may never know our names. Um, four, five, six generations, most of our names will be completely forgotten on this side of eternity. But for those who are His, called in Him, our names are written in the book of life. And what we do in this world, uh, the Lord can use in magnificent ways that no one may even see or hear about, but the Lord knows and knows in full because he's working out his purposes um, in and through so many uh, who remain nameless to us. And that's, that's, that's is all I have to say about the human writer we don't know. Um, though there's much, much speculation. The audience, similar, similarly, we don't know exactly who the original audience was intended to be, where, where they were located. Um, the church in Rome, Ephesus, Corinth, Galatia, we don't know. Um, but what we do know is it was a letter intended to the church, uh, to a suffering church who was going through tr great trials um, in their circumstance. Uh, a, a Hebrew, uh, a Jewish um, audience, largely. Um, uh, uh, this text is rich in Old Testament theology, uh, pointing to the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Persecution had come, uh, and they had endured it well for, for a long time, um, but it kept coming. Um, they joyfully accepted the seizure of their property, um, they sympathized with the prisoners, but it kept coming. The hardships of life kept beating the walls of their faith, so to speak. It was as if wave after wave, um, never, never stopping. Um, and it began to wear them down. Um, the walls of their faith seemed to be cracking um, and perhaps even on the verge of collapse from, from a certain perspective. Many of the believers were beginning to question and doubt. Um, Within the letter, we can see that the temple was likely still intact. So this letter was written before 70 uh, AD. Uh, Hebrew Christians, considering perhaps going back, um, the way of the law perhaps seemed easier than, than uh, this road of grace in the person and work of Christ due to their suffering. Um, and so the writer is putting forth to them this revelation of God himself bound up in Christ. Everything that the Old Testament pointed to, all the shadows um, <clears throat> pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is supreme. Uh, his uh, authenticity of the Messiah uh, is established. He points to us in this text uh, two, two key themes, the person of Jesus, who he is, and then to the work of Jesus, what he has come to accomplish. Uh, we often talk about those two things, the person and work of Jesus Christ. I, I love that phrase. I love that phrase. It's, 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 it's inseparable who he is and what he has come 
to accomplish. That's how he introduces number, uh, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he spoke to us in his Son. We are taken back to the special revelation of God. How can we know God, his divine nature, uh, his attributes, his character? How can we, as finite uh, creatures, know the one who is not limited by space and time, like we are? We're, we're, we're so limited uh, in what we know. Um, even what we know about creation is but just a speck of the scope of knowledge that is out there. We have no, there's so much we don't know. Um, and indeed, impossible to know uh, the living, eternal God um, rightly unless he reveals himself to us. And that is what he has done. Uh, even the, the very fact that we have um, the revelation of God put into human language that we can read and understand is a condes uh, it's, a, it's a humbling for God even to reveal himself uh, in, a, in, in human finite words. Um, it's an amazing thing to consider that the creator revealed himself to his creation, to his creature. Um, and the only way that man can know God is when God reveals himself to us um, uh, in the work, that's the work of the Holy Spirit that does so in these, in, in these pages uh, through the Holy Spirit. Um, and he's done so <clears throat> over time, progressively. We call it the progressive revelation. Uh, he spoke through the prophets in many portions and in many ways uh, in the Old Testament. God revealed himself uh, through, through his chosen prophets to reveal his character and nature and plan, um, his perfection, his righteousness, uh, his requirements. Um, there's 66 books in the Bible in our canon, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Um, the, uh, the, the human authorship of Scripture uh, scope, uh, spans through 40 uh, writers, uh, 40 divinely inspired human writers over a span of about 2,000 years, from the 20th century B.C. to the 1st century B.C. And we have the text in, before us today, preserved uh, by the power of uh, his, his Holy Spirit to reveal um, who He is to us. There's no other book uh, like the Bible. Um, no other. Uh, he, in the Old Testament, He spoke through the prophets. We have the full canon. And the full revelation uh, is self-authenticating, is self-revealing through the Holy Spirit. It's the living Word of God. Uh, Vodi Bauckham, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he gave an um, apologetics presentation on why, why the Bible, why can you believe the Bible. Um, he says this, this, these two sentences. He says, I choose, this from an apologetic standpoint, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They reported supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. Um, that's, that's a mouthful, but... Uh, it's a good, I, I like it. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself through the prophets. Uh, we have a reliable collection of those historical documents before us uh, today. The word of God spoken through the prophets to his people. Uh, but now the writer states in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the word of God. And we see that John 1, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, uh, what is the Word? Uh, it is his, God's self-revelation, uh, the self-expression, His self-expression in creation, uh, in His wisdom, 
the revelation of him, self-expression in, in, in his salvation. Um, it's the revelation of God. And the Word was with God. The second person of the Trinity, um, with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. God has communicated to us. He has spoken to us after the prophets in these last days most perfectly in his very own Son, in the Son of God, God the Son. The character and nature of God the Father is bound up and most clearly seen and evidenced to us in the character and person of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Colossians 2, 9, In Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So that, in our introduction, that's what Mary and Joseph were, were looking at. Uh, all the fullness of deity dwelled in bodily form. Uh, that's what we celebrate in this Christmas season. That's where we're to point our children uh, to His majesty. Um, all the fullness dwells in, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. And he has the final word. He is the final word uh, because he, uh, he has revealed himself. He is the final word. He is the peak of God's revelation uh, to us. John 14, 9, in the conversation that Jesus is having with Philip, uh, Philip wants, to, wants Jesus to show, show, me the, show us the Father, he asks. Uh, show us the Father. And Jesus answers, uh, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, previously, in John 10, 30, Jesus is speaking of uh, our eternal security, the eternal security of the sheep that the Father has given to the Son. Um, he holds them, the Father holds them secure in His hand, and the Son holds them, His sheep, secure in His hand. And He says, I and the Father are one. The Jews knew what He was referring to. He was referring to equality with God. And their reaction was to pick up stones um, to kill him. He knew that the, he, that the Lord Jesus Christ was declaring equality with God the Father. Um, it's important to be careful, I think, when, when approaching these topics. Um, it's very easy to fall into um, uh, heresy, even perhaps accidentally. So I hope I'm protected fr from that. Um, God the Father... Uh, did not become God the Son. That's not what Jesus is saying. Um, that's not what he's declaring. The two distinct persons are made clear in the text. The Father and the Son both hold the sheep uh, secure. The Father has given the sheep to the Son. Uh, so there's two distinct persons. The Father gives his sheep to the Son, and the Son lays down his life for his sheep. Uh, distinct persons, but one in essence, one indivisible essence. I like how Louis Burkhoff writes on the Trinity, um, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, distinct in person, but one in essence, one indivisible essence. God is one in his essential being or constitutional nature. And he says, in this one divine uh, being, there are three persons or individual substance, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John Calvin writes, by this, by person, then I mean a, subs a, 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 a subsistence of the divine essence, a subsistence which, while related to the other two, is distinguished from them by incommunicable properties. The whole undivided essence of God belongs equally to God the Son. Um, the whole undivided essence of God is bound up in God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The character and nature of God, the Father, is perfectly seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God the Son. And God has spoken through Him because He is God, uh, full deity, and yet, fully man, uh, he has revealed himself uh, and identified himself with mankind, uh, whom 
continuing on in the text, whom he appointed heir of all things, whom he also made the world. Uh, not only is he appointed heir of all things, he is the creator of all things. Colossians 1, 15, he is, the invisible, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That is to say he is preeminent in his creation. Not that he was the first to be created, but that he has preeminence over his creation, over the creation. Uh, he takes first place, in other words. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. We will continue. All things have been created through him and for him. He is the heir of all things. And he is appointed heir of all things because he is the creator of all things. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's who we consider this morning. Uh, that's who we uh, worship. That's our hope is bound up in him. The Lord Jesus Christ is heir of all things because he is the originator of all things. The pinnacle of that great inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ is the church for whom he has been sent to redeem, who he laid down his very life uh, to purchase with his blood. Uh, and, and each drop that was spilled, none was wasted. He inherits all for whom uh, he died and came to purchase. The ultimate fulfillment and culmination of times when the church is gathered to glory will be presented to him as his inheritance um, for which he accomplished. That's an amazing thing to consider, the plan and purpose of God. When it is completed, we will all be together and presented where every tear will be wiped away from the sorrows of this world and we'll be in awe at the innumerable many, I believe, that we will see there as we see his glory, um, the glory of the only begotten, uh, full of grace and truth. That's what verse 3, he is the radiance of his glory. That's an amazing way to, to put it. He, he is the radiance of his glory. John 1, 4, uh, we referenced, uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Uh, there was the true life, which coming into the world enlightened every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. The light of the world. He is the radiance of his glory. As followers of Christ, we are called to be ambassadors of, of, of him, right? We're to be ambassadors to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to reflect his character to others. That's what we are called to do um, as followers of Christ. But God the Son is not an ambassador of God the Father in that, in that, in that way, reflecting the character of the Father or reflecting uh, his nature. Um, he is the radiance, the radiance of his glory. Uh, and considering this text, I was thinking of the sun and the moon as an illustration. And then I, I listened to Dan afterwards and, and he was thinking the same thing. The sun radiates its own light and heat. There's no dark side of the sun. In every angle of the sun, it radiates light and heat. In the same way, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, radiates His glory. Um, uh, you've seen the slides of the size of the earth, the size of our sun, and then <clears throat> scientists have seen uh, uh, the, the, the comparing our sun to other stars in the galaxy, and you, you, you move the slide over, and here's our sun, and it's huge and massive, but then you go to the next larger star and it makes our sun look kind of small. And then you slide it over again and our sun gets even smaller. And, 
And then you slide it over again and, and again and again and again and, and you go to the largest star that, that is known to man and it makes our sun look like a tiny speck, like a little grain. You can barely see it on the slide. If, if you haven't looked that up, dude, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, but here, he is the radiance of his glory. He's the creator of all those things. Uh, the, the radiance that comes from the, from the sun, the power uh, that comes from the sun that, that, that provides life and heat to our earth is, is nothing compared to the radiance of the glory of God the Son. Uh, and as followers of Christ, we are more like the moon. Uh, in and of itself, the moon has no, no light, no, no life. In, in re regard to light, uh, we are to reflect the light of the sun. Um, uh, we are to reflect the light of his glory. We are to reflect the radiance of his glory to others. But the radiance and glory come from the sun, bound up in him. Uh, uh, he is the exact representation of his nature. The sun is the exact reputation of God because he is God himself uh, in his person and being and nature. Uh, this expression, the exact representation, is the only time uh, this expression is found in the New Testament. Um, it comes from a, the, the, a coin, a, a, a metallic coin that is stamped uh, by the die. Uh, that's the picture here, that he is the exact representation of, of God's nature. <coughs> the sun is the exact representation of God's nature because he is God. He who has uh, seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. The exact representation. Uh, Louis Burkhoff, in explaining the Trinity, would, would go on to say uh, regarding the, the Trinity being a mystery, uh, uh, this, this idea of the Son being the exact representation of, his, of, his, of the nature of the Father. Um, there is a, a mystery here, not in the sense of a uh, biblical sense that um, the tr a truth which was formerly hidden but now revealed, not, not in that sense of, of the word mystery, but, but in the sense that man cannot comprehend it. We cannot fully comprehend this, this mystery uh, and make it intelligible fully. Um, it's intelligible in, in some of its relations and, and modes of manifestation, but unintelligible in its essence, uh, 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 in its essential nature. Um, God the Son is um, the exact representation of God's nature because He is God. Uh, and He upholds all things by the word of His power. He is sovereign. Uh, now the writer shifts from the person of Christ, Jesus, to the work of Christ. Um, the supremacy in who He is and now the supremacy of what He has accomplished and what He does. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Um, he is sovereign, absolute. Every molecule and atom, uh, all that we spoke of, of the, the entire galaxy and universe, he upholds by the word of his power. Uh, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he is the not only the creator, uh, he is the sustainer. He hasn't created the world and just let it go on its own. He sustains and upholds everything in the sovereignty of his plan and will and his word. Um, he is omnipresent in all things. The Lord Jesus Christ is omnipresent and he is omnipotent in all things. Continue his work when he has made uh, purification of sins. He sat down at the right hand of God on the majesty on high. And we spoke last night of the work of Jesus Christ and the purification of sins, that he came, the savior of the world, uh, that he sat down at the right hand of God because the purification of sins has been made complete. We have peace with God because of the work he accomplished on the cross for all who trust in him and look to him. Uh, here we see uh, the, what the Hebrews would continue to, to, 
to expound upon is uh, the work of Lord Jesus Christ as our priest, um, as, our inter as our intercessor, um, who went to the throne of God the Father before us to offer, um, a, uh, make an offering for the purification of sins. And he did that in his own person. Uh, he sat down at the right hand of God. In the, uh, in the temple, in the tabernacle, there's lots of furniture uh, inside the Holy of Holies and all, all around, but there's one piece of furniture that's intentionally missing, and that's a chair. The priest had no chair when he would offer um, a sacrifice for his people. Uh, in, the, uh, in every year, he would, the high priest would offer a sin offering, but there was no chair. Every year, there would be an, he would return uh, again and again, and that priest would be replaced. Another priest would come. In fact, as, he, as, the, as the priest went in to uh, make this offering into the Holy of Holies, they had to tie a rope around his ankle. Uh, there was, I think, a bell that they could hear from the outside because only the priest could go in uh, in a very specific way. Um, and if that way was, was not fulfilled uh, in accordance to God's word, that priest would be struck down. Um, and then how would you go in and retrieve him? Uh, um, so the, the offering given or offered by the priest was not a superior, superior satisfactory offering. Um, that was accomplished solely in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He made fully the purification of sin. Um, we see the contamination of sin um, in the world, uh, in our own heart, in our own lives, but he made purification of those sins on behalf of his people. It's amazing to consider when we think of the circumstances of our, our family situations or um, of life, we see the, the effects of sin, the contamination of sin all, all around us. Um, uh, it may not be your sin directly, but it's the effects of sin. We see sickness, we see death, we see illness, uh, we see hardships and persecution and layoffs and it can go on and on. We see the uh, contamination of sin that impacts our life. Even uh, we who are in Christ, uh, we are impacted by it in this world. We live in a fallen world, contaminated, but he has made purification of sins. It points to the future uh, perfection where the Lord Jesus Christ will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The contamination of sin erased, eradicated when we were with him in glory um, because he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The work is finished in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is completed. And after having, uh, I'm sorry, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. The name Jesus uh, is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. Uh, it means the Lord saves. The Lord saves. Um, he has a better name than the angels uh, because he alone saves. And the salvation intended by him is for his people, for a fallen human race. The writer of Hebrews would say for the angels, there is no forgiveness of sins. They have no representative uh, they were not created in the image of God. The, the one-third of the angels that fell, there is no hope for redemption. Um, but for those, for us, uh, for, for us fallen, uh, we are dead in our sin. Uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation is offered. Not just offered, but it is granted uh, freely to all who look to him, who look upon his name. And he has inherited a more excellent name than the angels. It's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is Lord of all, and he saves all who look to him. Salvation is only in that name, 
in that person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing to consider uh, in, in this season, uh, uh, not just in this season, but every, every week we come together and we consider that. We consider the work of Christ who laid down his life, made purification of sins, and we, we worship that name. And that name alone, we worship him in his person. Um, as revealed through the scriptures, there's many who, uh, who present a Jesus in this world. Um, someone came to the a gas station, uh, I was pumping gas and a person approached me and uh, asked me if I knew Jesus, if I, if I, was, go if, if I was going to heaven, if, if I knew um, who Jesus was. And as we spoke, I, I, I realized that this was a Jehovah's Witness so I asked the question, well, let me ask you, is, is Jesus fully man? And it's maybe a strange question. And, and she said, yeah, 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 he's, he's fully man. I said, well, is, is Jesus fully God? Oh, well, he's certainly God-like. No, no, he has inherited a much more excellent name. And the only way that he can sit down at the right hand of God and make perfect uh, purification for the sins of all who would trust in him is because he is God, fully God and fully man. And he has a much more excellent name, um, the highest name. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Well, that's what we are here this morning to remember uh, as we continue in our services. Uh, we look to him not only in this season, but we are to look to him every day as revealed in the scriptures, the word of God, which point us uh, to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom is our hope. He alone is our hope. He alone is our glory. Um, uh, and, uh, and we worship him. We look to him. If you haven't trusted in him, there is no hope. Uh, there is no purification of sins made for those who reject the son. Um, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life bound up in him. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your son. <clears throat> Those words are really um, uh, uh, small in comparison of what is owed to you. Um, in your majesty and glory as revealed to us in your son. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would grant us grace to look to him, to trust in him more fully. Um, in this world, we have many troubles and hardships that come, and yet our hope is in you. Uh, and we have peace with you through your son, uh, through uh, his person and work offered on behalf of all who look to you. Not only do we have peace with you, the Father, we have uh, the peace of you dwelling within us through your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would grant us the grace uh, through the third person of the Trinity, the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to strengthen us um, as we reflect your glory, as we reflect the radiance of your Son to others and that you would receive the glory in that. Pray for every blessing, every spiritual blessing and peace upon your people, uh, that they, we would go out from here uh, with joy in our hearts, refreshed in hearing um, these essential, fundamental truths pointing us to your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>